Welcome to this week's episode of Petra Revolt. We're interviewing an absolute legend. He's been, good, been a good friend of mine for quite a while now. Um, and he's an all round good guy, very good character, very funny, always playing tricks on people. And we'll give you a quick clue. Here. Number one, one in the world championships five times in the last. And it actually handles reasonably well. The longest 14 laps I've ever known in history. So we have Steve Parrish. Steve, how are you doing? I'm all right, thanks, Danny. Yeah, really good. Oh, um, actually, I've got a sweet for me. I oh, don't tell me. Yeah, do you want one? No. Off. No, <laughs> last time it was it wasn't quite like actually I will eat that one because it's not it's not a blue mouth one. But the last time he got me, I think it was in the Isle of Man paddock about five years ago. <laughs> stupidly, I took a sweet off of him and I ended up walking around with blue mouth and everything else. But look, the police are in eh, at the back. There you can see the horses oh, coming. Yeah, that, that's the uh, they're coming to check you out. Check you out. <laughs> Has he gone MOT? There you go. There's your, didn't a couple of months. There's, ago. Your, there's your sweet pack. I'm not having anything from there. Are, and you better take that. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. No, how's things anyway, mate? Yeah, right? really good. Um, I've just celebrated, I uh, had a surprise birthday uh, two weeks ago, but my wife set me up with a, uh, a surprise party with 120 people, so it's my 70th birthday. Um, and um, it was really good. We'd just been back from South Africa uh, under the pretext we were going out for dinner for my birthday, and I ended up going down the bottom here, pulling off because my mate picked me up and said, Oh, we've just got to go and do something here. And there was 120 people in there that I haven't seen, for, lots of people I hadn't seen for ages, and it was really nice to catch up. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, it was good. I bet yeah, it was good. good night. But the bar bill was a bit serious, but yeah. never, you're, only, you're only 70 once, aren't you? Yeah, I'm saving up for my 80th now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but no, I'm really good, actually. I uh, had a nice start to the year with a great trip to South Africa, out there for about three and a half weeks. Uh, been test I'm testing, I'm racing a car at Goodwood in the members' meeting, which comes up in about th months, three weeks' time. So I've been testing that down at Snetterton. I'm going to, to Goodwood next week to do a bit more testing with that. Um, and I was last night at the Royal Automobile Club for yep. the Torrens Trophy Award, which went to Mike Trimby, who you know very well, yep. who's done a lot for our sport. Um, and uh, I'm playing golf and I'm playing tennis and doing lots of nice things that you can do when you're old. Oh, um, also, when you get old, if you don't like people and what they're saying and doing, you tell them to sod off because it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> That's the great thing about being old. Sounds like you're living the dream then. I am absolutely living. The, I am. I've lived the dream all along. I'm celebrating 49 years without a proper job now. Yeah. And I'm definitely too old to get one. So no, I'm having a great time. Ah, oh, brilliant. Mm. I've got a few questions. I'm not professional like you. Right. So, okay. um, yeah. I've got a few questions. Right. Okay. I'll do my best to answer them as daft as I can. Um, I've read your book, so. I know this, but to the Petrol Revolt viewer, viewers, how did uh, how did your career begin? Um, it began in not far away from where we are here now in Hertfordshire. Um, I was born about five or six miles from here, um, and uh, I love riding bikes around the field. I loved anything with an engine. In fact, there was a disused airfield which is in the village where I was born called Stephen Warden, which is just five miles across there. And uh, I just loved tearing around, doing anything. So I drove or rode whatever I could buy for about five quid, because that's all I ever had by washing people's cars and saving up money. And it could be an old crapped out Austin or Morris or whatever. It could be a James motorcycle. I had a matchless. Uh, I even had a Triumph Tigress scooter that would go as fast as I wanted to go. So it was just mucking around in the fields. And... I never ever expected to race motorbikes. It was never anything I ever planned to do. I didn't know what I was going to do. I was going to be a tractor mechanic and I sort of left school at 15. I didn't leave, I got expelled at 15. Um, and just got a bike on the road as you do when you're 16 and having ridden for probably five or six years, I was pretty fast, pre pretty mad on the road. Um, and just got with a bunch of guys in a pub not so far from here. And there was a fellow that repaired lawnmowers, there was a bloke that did paint spraying, there was a bloke that was a machinist and so on and so on. We decided to have a race team and I couldn't do any of the things that they did so I ended up being the rider. And it literally, my career started off in a pub in a village called Harston where we decided to go racing. We bought a dormobile van and we set off to Snetterton or Brands Hatch, wherever we went, with a Triton that we'd built between us. 
And it was such a pile of shit. Can I say shit? Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, I think that's why Brands Hatch is still slippery. It was all the oil that came out of my bike when I first <laughs> went there, which was 1972. And it just went on from there. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I never expected to be a professional motorcycle racer or doing what I'm doing now. And it just happened. Um, and I think that's really nice that you can start off not expecting it and it happens. It was just serendipity, just all the kind of things slotted together. But from there on in, I bought a 250 Yamaha, which I've got in my um, my barn outside, a uh, little TD2B that I've managed to buy back and restore it back to how it was. Started winning club racing, then eventually just went on. I had a fella called Harold Kopok sponsor me, which was nice, on 250, 350TZs. Then a guy called Dave Moore bought me a 500 Suzuki and a TZ750 Yamaha and when, and then I got a phone call from Suzuki and all of a sudden I'm getting paid to do what I did as a hobby. So, yeah, yeah very lucky. And I think back in my days, it, I wouldn't say it was any easier, but it, you could kind of muddle your way through it a bit as long as you could fix your bike. And you couldn't never go and buy a proper race bike back then. You made one. And that was how it all sort of started off. Um, so, yeah, just kind of happened, really. And um, I gave up my job being a tractor mechanic and went racing. And from motor motorbikes to running a team to truck racing to commentary, I've managed to sort of, as I said, keep out of a proper job. Yeah. Well, it's the bet. that's what I'm still trying to do now. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I'm kind of... I, I could be like a, an ambassador for keeping out of a proper job. I could coach people on how to do it. But But you've got to have... Obviously, you've got to have a bit of ability, you've got to have some luck, you've got to have things that line up. And it's so difficult for things to line up because you can kind of end up five years down the road and, and never kind of make it. And then you've got to get back in that big, ugly world that we, we do live in. So yeah. I do sometimes feel sorry for people that have kind of been on the cusp of making it as a professional rider and then don't because you've missed a lot of your life, haven't yeah. you, of not kind of establishing what you're going to do. And so it is pretty difficult out there. But... Yeah, I've um, I have um, Barry Sheen once said, if I fell in a cesspit, I'd come up with a salmon on my head. And he, was, <laughs> he was probably right. Yeah, I've been a very lucky person. I, uh, you say like the the people who didn't you know didn't quite make it to earn a living out of motorcycle racing. I had a similar. I was in a similar position. I'd sort of when I went and done road racing, yeah. I had to go and get a normal job. Yeah. And then that's what made me realise I yeah. can't be, I can't have a normal job. I, I know, I know, because it's not nice, is it? And I know I had a, I mean, I don't know if you did, but I did for about three or four years. I had a normal job. I literally was a tractor mechanic. I did an apprenticeship in Royston, which you've probably come through just up the road here. And I used to have to lay under tractors in the freezing cold, and I had to take wheels off, and your fingers were numb, and I hated it. I must admit, but that was kind of what I was going to do. That was going to be my life. Yeah. Uh, finally. Did stop doing that, and then I used to repair people's cars and bodge things up and so on. And I think had I not have made it racing bikes, I probably would have had a garage or something, or something along those lines. Because I was a decent mechanic. I guess. Some something around. Something like around. It would have been around an engine somewhere along the line, whether yeah. it was petrol, diesel, or whatever. It wouldn't have been a battery one because I can't be doing with all that, no. this battery nonsense. But I guess I would have ended up maybe owning a garage or doing something like that. So um, yeah, very very fortunate and. Um, luckily I never had to go back to doing that because as I said I went from racing bikes to racing running a team and it was great last night meeting up Terry Reimer was there no Terry wasn't but Rob Mack was there Keith Hewen was at the event I was at last night and they were riders for me back yeah, in yeah. the day they didn't earn a lot of money out of me I can assure you <laughs> I used to take most of it um, but then the team was very successful but then truck racing turned up and then commentary turned up so um, yeah I've been a lucky guy yeah, oh, that was sort of going into the next sort of series of questions. Like, you obviously had a very successful motorcycling career, um, and obviously your friendship with with Barry, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but you went on to do a lot of lot of other things, running the team. You run the Loctite team, didn't I you? I did. Yeah, I did. And again, that was fortunate. Um, well, I say it's fortunate, but I did. People think I'm just a bit of a joker, but I am a bit of a grafter. I know what I'm up to. I, I work hard at what I'm doing. Uh, and the Loctite thing came about because Loctite at the time were based in Welland Garden City. That's not far from here. And I got to meet a guy that used to do their car repairs and spraying. And then he, I asked him if he could introduce me to the managing director of the company. And I literally turned up there one day with a jacket and tie on and put a proposal to them. And it wasn't a very professional pro proposal, but I knew that they were spending money promoting their products, which yeah. was super glue was the big thing back in the day. And they sponsored a horse racing team. 
um, which seemed a bit ridiculous because Loctite, you didn't, you don't glue a horse together, um, but you do a motorbike. So I sort of put this proposal to them that they should use the products that they made, which was thread locking and gluing and this and the other. Uh, and they ended up giving me um, a horse box. And you will have seen that horse box for, for years and years. It went round with uh, r with me, with Loctite Yamaha, Ca Cadbury's Boost, Rob Mack had it, and then it went to Fast Orange or something like that. But they didn't give me any money, and so they gave me this truck, and they said, look, you use this truck, paint it all up, go around the paddocks, and it was successful. I was starting to win races with my bike with Loctite on it. So sometimes you have a bit of luck, but you also have to find places where you can get some money from and so I did that um, and it you know it was a huge connection we were hugely successful with the team with uh, Keith Hewin, Trevor Nation, uh, Rob Mack, Terry Reimer, uh, Mark Phillips they were all riders for me, Neil McKenzie and then at the TT I used to have Jeff, Jeff Johnson and um, Nick Jeffries they were my TT riders and it was great success so much so that Loctite wanted to continue it but I couldn't because I had a um, a proposal from Mercedes-Benz to raise trucks for them. So I had to kind of relinquish the team and um, that, this sort of history, Rob Mack took it over. Yeah. yeah. And going back a bit, obviously talking about your racing career, um, you were successful and like you just said, you know, you got on, you got a, an opportunity from Suzuki to be mm. Barry's teammate. Mm. Um, what happened in the 1977 British Grand Prix? I can't tell you. Oh, what happened? I'm sorry, I thought you were going to say what happened in our lives back then, but I can't even tell you that. But what happened in the the 1977 British Grand Prix was I could have been famous, Danny. Mm -hmm. Trust me. Um, it was my best year, and uh, I, I don't know if I peaked early, but I very fortunate. I was living the dream, traveling the world with a bloke that I used to have posters up around the wall and still do for that matter, Barry Sheen. And there was Phil Reed and there was Ray Pickerel and John Cooper and all these famous people. And all of a sudden, literally, I was picked up from club racing as such and national racing and thrust into this world of Grand Prix. Uh, first time I ever went on an aeroplane was 1977 to go to the Venezuelan Grand Prix. I'd never been like, I'd never been anywhere doing it. And I'm sat next to Barry Sheen and all these famous people going off to do the Grand Prix. Uh, and I had, in 77, I had Barry's 1976 bike. It was the bike he'd won the championship with and he'd got the next grade up. But a great year, uh, finishing in the top five all the time and learning tracks and everything else. But the British Grand Prix, which was the final race of 1977, was the only single solitary track that I knew because all the rest of them were Venezuela and in Austria and in Germany and in France and all these new circuits and you never got a lot of practice then. So I kind of, I was doing all right, but it took me time to learn the circuits. Anyway, we get to Silverstone and I was hot at Silverstone because I'd ridden there quite a lot and uh, yeah, pretty much got on to win the race until the last lap came over the uh, start and finish line and my mechanic that, that back then was a guy called Martin Brookman, big tall lab and he had a chalkboard and it would be coming out lap three to go and so on and so on and with lap two it was P1, I was leading the race, um, two laps to go and then came around to start the last lap and Barry Sheen had broken down, nicked my pit board off of Martin Brookman uh, and as I came to start the last lap with a three second lead all it said was gas it on the pit board <laughs> as I went past and to this day I'll never know whether it kind of made me laugh or whatever it must have uh, I must have been quite surprised to not see P1 plus three because I knew I'd got a lead I looked over my shoulder went to the first corner at Silverstone and crashed at Cops Corner oh, but it had it was like, it was drizzling a it bit, was drizzling with rain it was and I was the first one to encounter that corner with wet on it I fell off couldn't believe it as I slide along the track I thought it was some sort of bad dream and then a guy called John Williams, who sadly got killed later on in the following year, I think, uh, he went on to lead the race. He went to Beckett's down the bottom and he crashed in the rain. And Pat Hennan, who was our third team member for Texaco and Suzuki's, went on to win the race. So it couldn't have been worse. And then I got fired at the end of it by the team manager for being an idiot, I think. Really. Yeah. So it was a bad day. It was a good year. Finished fifth in the World Championship, racing with Agostinis and Johnny Giacottos and Pat Hennan's and people like that. But anyway, it didn't happen. So Suzuki's budget got cut back. But Parish Luck kicks in. George Harrison came along to sponsor me. So I had the, one of the Beatles backing me for the 78 year <coughs> with a, uh, a skateboard company. But yeah, uh, I'd love, I mean, wouldn't everyone love to win the British Grand Prix? No one has actually ever won the major class, the premier class yeah. British rider at the British Grand Prix. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, it'd be something special, wouldn't it? It would be for, something for special. I got the lap record and held it for a few years, but there you go. And um, what, uh, that sponsorship deal, like, off one of the beat, how, how did that come about? Because now, one of our most... In your day, it was it was different. Like you boys were were here. You you boys were almost like footballers, weren't you? Um, well, Barry Sheen was. I don't think you know. I was like hanging on the coattails, I guess, to a certain extent. And I get a lot of stick from people. Oh, you're always just because you were Barry Sheen's mate. But we were mates, and it's the end of it. And yeah. people say you were just in his wake, and it's absolutely right. I was in his slipstream, and it was good slipstream, and it wasn't just on the track. <laughs> it was around the nightclubs and with all the girls and everything else. I didn't probably get the best one, but nevertheless, I did all right. You but, get the ugly mate. I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but not the midnight one. Um, but it, it it was a wonderful time whizzing around the world in Rolls Royces and doing lots of great things and so on and so on. Um, but yeah, and I'd got to meet George Harrison in 77. He used to come to some of the races and the Eric Idle and some of the Monty Python guys had come along and... And George was really pissed off that Suzuki's had dropped me because they said they only had budget for two riders and Barry was obviously going to get the sponsorship and Pat Hennon ended up third in the World Championship and I was fifth. So they had to choose the best two, I guess the fastest two at the time. Um, but George said, oh, don't worry, I'll Stavros, I'll help you out with a few tyres and some petrol and gave me a cheque for 50 grand, which in 1978 was a shitload of money. And it bought me some bikes and trucks and bits and pieces and stuff like that. Yeah. And anyway... It was a it was a good year again. I finished pretty good in some of the British Championship. I won the 500 cc Shell Sport Championship, uh, domestic championship, and um, did good enough with George's money for Suzuki's to re-employ me in '79. So, um, yeah. but even when I was riding, in the bikes were yellow because it was Makaha Skateboards and Harry Songs Limited and Dark Horse Records, which was George's record labels. Suzuki's helped me out with bits and pieces and so on and so on. So it wasn't a terrible year. It was just. Um, Kind of, I was just in different colours, but still using the same garage with Barry and the team and so on and so on. Yeah, and you also rode Yamaha's as well for a while, didn't you? I did. After, um, well, same, it's, I guess, where Barry went, I went. He switched, he fell out with Suzuki's at the end of 79, went to Yamaha, never got the right bikes in the early days, but got paid a load of money, and uh, I eventually switched over to Yamaha's in 81, running 500 and 750 Yamahas and things like that with sponsorship from Mitsui. It was called Mitsui Yamaha. They were UK importers. Uh, and did that right the way up until I retired. I ran a 500 Suzuki a lot of the time and TZ 750s and things and did okay. I mean, I was kind of um, top four or five winning some of the British championships and shell sport championships and, and things like that. I won the 500 European race in the UK at Donington. But as years went by, I realised I wasn't getting any faster, I was getting older, uh, and in 85 got married, children coming along, and I decided that it would be a good time to stop, but Loctite persuaded me to carry on running the team, and so that's how that all came about. I decided, did my last race in Macau in 86, uh, finally got banned from going to Macau for blowing up the brothel out there, that was another, another story. Um, but it was a great relationship and um, the team was hugely successful. The first year, 1987, was my first year running the team. Keith Hewen won the, the Super Stock Championship. Uh, then I think we won a British Championship in, uh, sorry, 80, would have been 88. Uh, with Mark Phillips and then Terry Reimer won a couple of championships. Terry Reimer won World Superbike races for me yeah. when we were doing World Superbikes with him and Rob Mack. So it's a great team. Yeah, really enjoyed running the team. You do miss, um, as you're going to find as time goes on, you're not standing on the back of the truck waving at all the crowd because as a team manager, you're sort of in the background a little bit. Yeah. But you get a lot of satisfaction from producing a team, and it is a team with all the mechanics and everything else and a bike for people to go out there and win. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so how did the opportunity, the truck racing opportunity come about? I go back, Barry Sheen again, um, because Barry, and if you remember, in his last year of racing bikes, um, which would have been 84, 5, yeah, he, he, was, he, he ran a Suzuki, went back to Suzuki after Yamaha, yeah. uh, and that blue Suzuki, and it had Heron on it as well, but it had Daff Trucks, Daff yeah, yeah. Trucks sponsored yeah. him. Um, and so he had an association with DAF Trucks UK and truck racing turned up in the UK in, it would have been 85. There was a race at Donington Park called the Multi Park Truck Grand Prix. And Barry said, oh, Stavros, he said, I've got a deal. They want me to race a truck. And I was really pissed off because I'm 
definitely Barry Sheen was a far better racer on a bike than I was but whenever we raced cars I used to kick his ass so I said no oh, sorry I won't have a go at this truck racing malarkey turned up at Mercedes-Benz UK and said Barry Sheen's driving a daft truck if you give me a Mercedes I'll beat him and I did and that was how it all all went off we went to Donington and I was faster than him in the truck um, and it, it just sort of snowballed from there on in so I'm racing bikes I'm racing trucks I'm starting to do some commentary work so I'm juggling all the balls and everything else so truck racing carried on while I was running the team quite a lot, but it was a little embarrassing at times because I was missing some of the bike races going off and doing the truck races. So I'm trying to dovetail it all together. Finally, it would have been in 91, yeah, Mercedes said to me, look, we want you to be a factory driver. And they offered me a big fat kind of contract to go and do it. And I was really weighing up whether to carry on running the team and whatever. And in the end, Yamaha weren't happy because I was clearing off doing truck racing as well. And I thought, you you know, I can only race trucks for so long because you know, of age. You, you've got a period of in your life where you're still competitive. And I thought, sorry, I'll have a go. And I did. For 10 years, I raced for Mercedes-Benz. And I earned far more out of racing trucks than I did racing motorbikes. Yeah. And without going to hospital all the time. That was the upside. Yeah. That's so, the thing. When you get in a car or, or like a truck, you feel... You yeah. instantly feel a bit safer, don't you? Because you've got stuff around you. Absolutely. Uh, you know, there's, the, the penalty isn't as uh, as bad, is it? That's the problem with motorbikes. If you make a little mistake, you're sliding down a road and probably going to a visit in some weird hospital yeah. with, wondering who you are. Whereas the truck racing, I was still, I was hugely competitive because I won five sort of world championships in the trucks. And the, the only injury I ever got from truck racing, I broke my scaphoid, I think, here when I got smashed into and the steering wheel got me. But other than that, it was great. Yeah. And that went on right the way through um, to 2001, yeah. So I had another long sort of ke period where I was not devoid from bikes. I still had an involvement um, doing odds and ends and stuff, a bit of commentary when it fitted in. When I wasn't racing trucks, I'd go and do World Superbikes. And in fact, Roger Burnett would do the weekends I couldn't do for the commentary, and then I'd do the trucks and so on and so on. Oh, it was a great, great time. I really enjoyed that. Uh, still able to race and be very competitive in something that didn't hurt quite as much. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I'm assuming after that come the, the t more TV work for you. It did. Um, talk about being a lucky person because at the end of my truck racing career, which was 2001, BBC took on doing World Superbikes. The first time the kind of terrestrial channel had taken it on. Um, and I kicked off doing that with a fellow called Lee Diffie, who was an Australian guy that came over and I worked with him for a year. And then he went off to work in America and then Charlie Cox came in because he'd just retired from yeah. racing touring cars <laughs> and did another long period from 2001 or two, right the way through to 2013, covering MotoGP, Susie Perry, Charlie Cox, myself, Matt Roberts, Gavin Emmett, all those guys yeah. all came through. Um, Again, traveling around the world, doing something I love doing. So that was another long period of my time. Yeah. And, uh, the only danger in that was the hire car races, really. That was, that was the only And thing. pretending you was a doctor on a flight. Exactly, yeah, 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 yeah. Pretending I was a doctor on an aeroplane. And that was really just for John Hopkins, because they weren't going to let him fly. Um, so I stepped up and said, I'm a doctor and uh, he can fly. And the, the captain, I remember, said, have you got any identification? How do we know you're a doctor? And so I gave my business card, and on all my business cards and emails and letterheads, I've got NLAMN, which looks like you've got some sort of title, but it stands for no letters after my name, because I've never got any. And I've got PhD, because I did some Pete's Hut delivery work, so that's written on there as well, and he went for it. But the worst thing on that flight was, they came and saw me halfway through the flight, because they got a problem at the back of the plane, and I thought I, thought I was going to have to de deliver a baby, or sort out a heart attack or something, but luckily... It was nothing serious. It was just some drunk. But it was, I, you know, I mean, when I look back on it, uh, if anyone's watching this and you want to pretend to be a doctor on an aeroplane, don't because it gets you in a load of shit. I got into a lot of trouble over it, really. That's yeah. lots of things I've got into trouble over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that was the era. That must have been the the era I was in the in the paddock. Then I must have met you in '07. Properly in 07. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. it would have been about that, that sort of period of time when we were going around. And, and I love working for BBC because the reason I like working for BBC, there was probably getting on for one and a half, two million viewers every week. Yeah. Motorbike racing was really popular in, in the UK because 
you know, people I play tennis with and people I play golf with, uh, got nothing to do with motorbikes, would watch MotoGP because at two o'clock Sunday afternoon it would be on their main channel. Yeah, mainstream TV. Um, yeah, and it, brilliant. you know, it really did build a lot of traction. And obviously, Valentino Rossi was in there, and he was the hero of the time. And we had Cal Crutchlow, Bradley Smith, people that were doing okay in MotoGP. Um, and it's just, it's a shame. And I understand it. Dorna, in fact, I was with some of the Dorna guys last night. Uh, and they admit they know that their viewing figures are probably 10% what they used to be, but they get money from those TV channels to help fund the racing that goes on. Yeah. But it's, it is a shame that we don't have terrestrial TV for, for motorcycle racing because it, it's still very much a tiny minority sport. Yeah, it is. And, and you sort of want to bring back... But then again, it's difficult, isn't it? Because we, we have had some characters, we've had some fantastic riders, but yeah. not the character like what? Like what you guys were, you know, like like Barry, like yourself, and yeah, but, but I don't know if you ever can. I'm, I'm, I have this conversation with lots of people. Well, when's the character? How can you be a character when you're not allowed to do anything? This nowadays? is a problem, isn't yeah, it? That, it's that's social network, it's social media, but not just that. In my time, and if you went back further than me, it'd probably some some of the professional riders like your John Coopers and Mike Hales and people like that. You know, they, they literally just rode at weekends. And Barry and I, were to a certain extent, we went and raced our bikes at weekends and then we went off and had fun the rest of the time. Yeah. Where now you're seeing a psychiatrist, the dietitian, the gymnasium. Yeah. You know, you name it. It's a seven-day-a-week job. And then yeah. you start, you know, you've got to be there on the Thursday to do your media stuff and then you're testing Friday and Saturday and racing Sunday. And then on Monday, I say, you're back in the gym or seeing the dietitian or seeing the psychiatrist or whatever you are doing. You haven't got really got time to be a character, have you? No. You are a, a homogenised being that is being steered down this particular route. And that would apply to tennis and football and rugby and motorbike racing and car racing and anything you can think of. You are now this kind of machine, aren't you? Yeah. You really yeah. are. And if, if you're seen wavering off that line, as some r more recent riders have, you're sacked, aren't you? I mean... You know, there's been riders that we've known that haven't been seen, your go and whatever you might want to talk about. They've kind of wavered off that kind of thin line that you're supposed to go down and you're fired. So it's yeah. very difficult nowadays yeah. to be a character. It really yeah. is. Well, imagine like uh, even when I when I first went into Grand Prix, it was it was weekend by weekend. And yeah. like you're just saying now, you're off a bike Sunday, you're back on a bike Monday yeah. with a lot of people. You know, yeah. they're back, whatever they're doing, supermoto yeah. riding or yeah. Yeah. riding a mini sure. bike, that that. That back riding straight away, and yeah. it wasn't even like that in my day. And that yeah. we I, used to have some good parties on the Sunday sure. night, but yeah. in in your day, imagine if you had social media back then. Oh my God, I'd be in prison, wouldn't I? <laughs> yeah. um, definitely. Yeah. But of course, the other thing is, and I, I do harp on it about a lot. It's not just the time that you're doing that. You, we're talking about MotoGP rides. I reckon if you went through MotoGP grid, and I'm using it as an example, if you go back t 15 years. They'll all have been kids in some kind of an academy when they were nine years old. Yeah. So they actually haven't had what I call a normal life. No. They wouldn't have got a shag behind a bus shelter or no. whatever, you know, and had a fag behind as kids, as normal kids, growing up with other people at the local youth club having a bit of fun, because they got put into that stream of an academy when they were nine or ten years old. Yeah. Casey Stone is a good example. He lived with his mum and dad, didn't he, in a caravan. Yeah. He didn't have any fun because he was you know, living in a caravan with his mum and dad, travelling around the world racing. And yeah. don't get me wrong, I'd love to be Casey Stone and have the talent and the ability that he had, but he didn't really have what I call a, a normal life growing up. Yeah. And, and it, I think a lot of the kids, Spanish, Italians and whatever, the same thing's applying. I think that was the era where it started changing because then me and Bradley had it when we went into the academy, went yeah. into Dorna's academy and it was like... What age were you then? 13, right. uh, 12, 13. Okay, and we right. was going out on 30 kilometre cycles, 40 right. kilometre cycles at that eight, and that's right. how they, they drilled it into you. Yeah. But now, if you want to make it in a sport, that's what that's You'd what be too you late at 13, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You'd be eight or late. seven. <laughs> it, it is quite extraordinary. And I, I wouldn't say I've, I don't feel sorry for the guys because they're doing better than probably their mates that are just not doing anything. But what I feel sorry for is, and, and if you don't make it, you can be on the scrap heap at 20 years old, can't you? Yeah, and I think, like, us, everyone at Petrol Vault, we like hearing about the old school and, mm. and you know, the, the stories what go with mm. it because mm. there's that, um, there's that, 
you get to see the personalities and sure. stuff what gone on. Like like you said, blowing a brothel up in Macau. Mm. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. You would yeah. Ne- if you had that now, that they they would be uh, well. It's like Bang Yai, wasn't it? Last year, yeah. When he got, oh, when yeah. he had a couple of drinks and he got pulled up or whatever. It yeah. was like. And then everyone was on his back. Yeah, you know. Sure. Yeah, well, because all the sponsors get nervous and so on and so on. And and in fact, I was chatting to um, it would have been Mike Trimby last night because he was involved in the Macau thing when the toilet uh, the <laughs> brothel got blown up. But but the the fight. The, the, I mean, you can't even imagine it now. <laughs> Motor Soccer News over there. I've read it today on the train coming home from London. And it's got like something about the Northwest and it's got something about this. But the headline in nineteen. Uh, would have been 84 or 5 or something. Most of the news headline was Gang Bang Goes Wong. Because <laughs> it, it was about them blowing out the broth. Can you, can, they couldn't even write that now, could they now? Because it's got to be something about the you know the latest Yamaha fucking off road bike or something like that. But yeah, it was Gang Bang Goes Wong. Yamaha did give me a call. They weren't well impressed with it, actually. But, but yeah. Oh, it, your name was mentioned in it. And, yeah, yeah oh, very it. much so. Yeah. But it was, it was sort of funny and, and we all enjoyed doing it. And we just. Just, yeah, it did have a lot of fun. Because we were kids, enjoying the life that we were doing, doing something that back then, this is, we like talking about the olden days, but we do tend to glass over and forget a lot of people died. Yeah. That was the it other was, side. It was, it was very dangerous, wasn't it? It was a... It, I'm not qualified to say, but it's a bit like a war zone. And I, yeah. I was, luckily, I was never in a war. But you knew that, you know, there would probably not be someone go away from that Grand Prix. It, and, and I know this sounds horrible, but the TT is a bit like that. You know that. You, there's going to be, unfortunately, the it's 1.6 people a year, sadly, pass away at the Isle of Man. But it was like that in Grand Prix. Yeah. It really was. You know, you c- drove out that paddock, and I remember driving out of the Belgian Grand Prix and the French Grand Prix and even the Silverstone Grand Prix where there was a van and caravan left there because the person didn't make it because yeah. the tracks were dangerous, yeah. massively dangerous. So I think that sort of made us live like, a bit wild yeah you know, you're a bit of a lunatic because you knew that you know you had to cram it all in and some of us survived it and an awful lot of my mates didn't yeah mm. yeah and what about the um it is a famous story in Imatra with the toilets um yeah. now i've been i've been we've been to Imatra racing and well you need to thank me for the toilets <laughs> the way the fins are but the way the fins are they're so serious as well aren't steady they? aren't they i just so, i couldn't i no. could not imagine that happening no, they especially so, there because it's yeah. a very nice part of the world as well yeah and the, the, that lake near the paddock there yeah. when we used to go there they wouldn't let you run outboard engines in it because it was like kind of it was a a, a sort of a lake that was so crystal clear water and everything else and yeah uh, well, so again, it was back to Barry Sheen again. He said, we're going to get rid of the toilet blocks. It's disgusting. And and uh, and I said, well, yeah, if you want to, you know, it was my first year and Barry was still a big hero of mine. He said, just go and get 20 litres of Avgas and spread it all around. And the funny thing was, I thought he was going to set fire to him, but he's, he stood back and said, I'll keep guard Stavros. <laughs> <laughs> You go and do it, and I did, and the whole shit house roof blew off and ended up in that lake, smouldering in the lake that you had to wear. You had to not use an outboard engine in, um, but it went a bit wrong because a lot of the competitors weren't impressed because when the shit house roof blew off, all the poo went over their awnings and tents and everything else. There. And in fact, I've, I've just shown you. I've got the toilet. So some friends of mine at my birthday party made up a toilet seat that's all sort of burnt and exploded and that's the sort of what they reckon that was what was left of the toilet block <laughs> but anyway new toilet blocks in there so i'm sort of proud that i've been involved in improving toilets around the world yeah, yeah exactly yeah, yeah. another little string to my bow but yeah i don't think that would happen at silverstone or brands hatch or God. but then the toilets are right there. so part of mike trimby has just recently got the torrens trophy for his part in my life and your life of really getting on to the organisers because back in my days the FIM and the organisers were all in cahoots you never got paid much money they didn't care if run rider died because there'd be another one fill that place they didn't give a shit about the damp the dangerous circuits Mike Trimby got involved with improving circuits improving toilet blocks a bit like myself and and just making it much much safer and a much nicer environment to be involved with and and, and all credit to him because he's done a good job because in the early days he was hated by the FIM the organizers and everyone else because he was the one that was stirring it up saying this isn't right no he's he's done a fan for and for the British for British motorsport he's done a fantastic job and he because he he looked after me when I was there and and Irene his wife as well like every time I used to have a crash 
um, my mum used to contact Irene, and, and oh. Irene was always there straight sure. away. Yeah, you know, yeah. And, they were like family, weren't they? They were like your godparents that were at the track. Yeah. Um, and and when it when you make it good in Grand Prix, it filters down. It becomes better in BSB. It becomes better in club race, and everything filters down. Yeah. So it makes the whole world and environment that we are involved in, which is motorcycle racing, much much safer. So they've done a great job. But but um, you know, I guess back then we were in the early days. We were quite naive because we didn't give a damn. We didn't even think about about dying i mean unfortunately you just turned up there and you focus on that ribbon of tarmac and you just rode your bike around and did what you're doing but eventually kenny roberts was a big part of it as well because when kenny came over from america he went man this place is crazy when we had to race at the nurburgring and you know uh, finland was a street circuit and um spa to a certain extent yeah. was a street circuit so i think his influence and he was as you know kenny Rose, he wouldn't hold back on saying anything and he just yeah. go this place is shit we need to do something about it and we actually nearly came to a riders um kind of breakaway group yeah. and hence that was when mike trimby got involved so uh, yeah, lived through a lot of dangerous, dangerous times and seen a, a massive change in what we used to have to do to how it is now and, and for the better. Yeah. But we've lost the characters because they yeah. are, you know, they're machines nearly now, aren't they? Yeah. Mm. And what about your your TT career? Because you've done quite a few TTs. I you? did, yeah. And in fact, in my gym where all my um, bikes are, I've got 13 replicas. So that I probably did 20 races because you used to break down a lot in those days. Um, I was never what I'd say a TT rider. I did it because A, I wanted to do it. B, Suzuki wanted to do me do it. And Yamaha when I rode for them. But I was very much, a, I, I th I'd say, a, it's hard to define, an 80% rider around there. I knew full well that your limits uh the penalty is bigger than the crime if you got it all wrong and i rode at the pace i wanted to which usually was around a fifth or a sixth or a seventh and that's where most of my results were finally got i got a third in a production race uh fairly early on had a fifth you know on an fj 1200 yamaha around there and then finally get a third in an fz 750 and then got disqualified which was really annoying joey dunlop won the race it was a senior race i think or formula one Tony Rutter, Michael's dad, got second and I got third. And then about an hour afterwards, they chucked me out because my fuel tank was literally a tiny bit, 200 cc's oversized, and I'd stopped twice and got three litres of gas in it. But but that was my sort of TT career. I was never going to win a TT because I was yeah. never going to beat Joey Dunlop or, you know, those guys that Mick Grant, I guess you'd say, Roger Marshall, they were what I call proper TT riders that... That was their main game. That was yeah. what they wanted to do. I wanted to go to the TT and come home again. So yeah. I kind of, but I'm pleased I did it. Found it hugely exhilarating, as I know you will have done. It's that kind of um, build up to it. You wonder why you're doing it, and then when you finished it, you go, "That's why I'm doing it because yeah. I feel so good about it." Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's always, always when I've done it, always afterwards. I suppose a bit like you see the TT guys are still still a bit old school aren't they you know afterwards yeah. they have a couple of pints and they enjoy yeah. themselves and yeah. I suppose that's a little bit of the element of what you you were talking about you I know, think like, it is yeah because the majority of guys um like you rightly say will just chill afterwards and they're they're kind of more normal people there won't be yeah. someone telling them that they can't be doing that they can't have a pint because they're going to be in the gym the next yeah. day you know yeah. when you talk about the people that that have been winning your John McGinnis and your Michael Dunlops and your Hutches and people like that they are very much, yeah, it, more like I was, we were. They're okay. protein shakes, a bottle of beer, aren't they? Absolutely, yeah. it is, yeah. And again, it's when you're at the Northwest 200, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which I'm really pleased to heard today that it is going ahead. The Northwest oh, brilliant, 200. that's fantastic. I've had a big problem with insurance and road racing has had a big problem. And I say to people, and I hope I'm wrong, but if you want to go to the TT, I think you should do it sooner rather than later. Because one of these days these road races won't happen we've had yeah. a scare this year a lot of races in ireland aren't going to happen and i understand why because if you're an insurance broker can you imagine going and doing the health and safety walk around the tt you well yeah it's, it's not just it's not just the competitors is oh no it? it's, it's more third party liability yeah. because the problem with the road circuit is you've got mrs miggins with a tea tray outside with her cousin and her uncle you know drinking their their pg tips and having a piece of um uh, coconut cake and there's a bloke going past yeah. what could be Michael Dunlop doing 200 miles an hour yeah. and he's like where this camera is that close so it's hugely exhilarating go and see it but I don't think it will go on forever yeah that that was going to be my next question what do you think the future is of the TT well um 
I love the TT, I did it, I enjoy going out there, I work out there doing some hospitality work now. I enjoyed commentating on it for many, many years with some great people, um, working out there, doing it for a long, long time with James Whittam and I, and yeah. um, Craig Doyle used to do it. Had a lot of fun doing it, uh, got moved aside, I guess I got too old really, they want younger people in there, and they seem to want girls and people like that that don't really know what they're talking about, but never mind, better brush over that. Um, uh, and uh, But I still enjoy it. But I do understand from the other side of it. There's one or two, not one or two, a lot of people on the Isle of Man actually don't like it because it disrupts their life. I'm well aware it's got a huge amount of history there uh, and a lot of people know the Isle of Man because of the TT. But one of these days, someone is going to say, I don't think I can insure it. So I don't know how it could go on for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, or it could go on for two or three years. I don't really yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. But I do feel that it's... It's nearly alien to the world that the cotton wool yeah. world that we're living in now, and it is a cotton wool world. I'm actually quite pleased I'm old because I'm fed up with flipping woke, yeah, and all the nonsense that's going on. You you get an electric car, aren't you? Am I? I'll never ever ever have an electric car. I'll be out there putting horse shit or whatever you have to do to make an internal combustion engine work, anything, but I'll never have an electric car and I'll never ride an electric motor bike. I, I can see they've got their place. If you want to go and deliver pizzas and things, then then go and do it on your electric bike. And if you have a proper job, which I'm never going to have, and you go backwards and forwards to the solicitor's office at 10 mile away, I'm sure it'll work, but it's the smell and the noise that I like and, yeah. I, and I always will. So, yeah, I'm, I'm old enough to say that because I don't have to do it. Yeah. yeah. Well, Steve, I think that's about it. But uh, I'll probably right. bored you to tears. Um, <laughs> and uh, any time you want to have a chat. But uh, as I say, motorcycle. People say to me, "What was your best time, motorcycle racing, truck racing?" There's no comparison. Motorcycle racing was was what started me off doing what I'm doing. It's ingrained into me. I still watch it avidly. I still like going to the races. I like the smell of the noise, and I like the people. Yeah. Even though some of the people that we meet don't look to be characters you know behind the scenes they actually really are yeah there's yeah. a lot of people that you would never believe that are really funny people but they can't be seen to be doing it can they i tell you he was a bit like that danny pedroza was a bit like that yeah he was when you see him at the race meeting he was so serious but then yeah. when you see him outside he was just a, he was a complete different person he came to goodwood and he was such a well i love i've always been a big admirer of danny um and and he's a similar stature to you even smaller than you yeah. and i could never yeah. believe how he could get a motor yeah. gp bike with 250 horsepower around like he did yeah. and and I loved the time with him big fan of his um, and he came over to Goodwood and, and whatever but a lot of the guys you know Valentino Rossi uh, you could say Casey Stoner comes to Goodwood and people like that they're actually once they've kind of got out of that little world that they're supposed to be in they're really nice people I, I, they can enjoy it for yeah. what it is then yeah, yeah. sure sure yeah absolutely but there you go what would you, what would you say your career highlight was then uh, blowing up brothels and toilets and yeah. things like that, yeah, yeah. Causing, causing absolute pandemonium, being doctors on aeroplanes and bus racing, I guess you'd say. My career highlight has been smiling, laughing, and I think having written the book and done my mad tour theatre shows, making a few other people laugh about what we used to get away with, I guess you'd say, yeah. um, and having a wonderful, wonderful life. I'm a bit cranky in the legs now because I've broken them and bits and pieces and stuff like that, but... Yeah, I'm I'm a very lucky person. I'll always remember that. Brilliant. Well, thanks for speaking to us, mate. Pleasure. And one thing, Barry Sheen's last words to me, and this is a real kind of sad thing, but remember his words, and it was two weeks before he passed away, he said, at least we're not going to die wondering. And that means get on with your flipping life because we're only here for so long. Take care. Don't forget to like and subscribe to Petra Revolt and visit our website for our upcoming events. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.